Hi, everyone. Anyone who's here, it's 6.58, so we've got just two minutes. Opening the room. Cool. Yeah, so um, we just have six, it's 6.58, so we just have two minutes to go. I'm gonna be sharing my screen with you all. I'm so happy that you're here on this very last day of um, summer 2017, it's passing us by. Looks a tad bit grainy right here now, but not to worry. I'm gonna be sharing our screen. And you're gonna get to see what I've got to share with you. So 6.59, I'm just get my screen all warmed up here. Uh, so when we start at seven o'clock, you guys will be the first to be here and be ready to go. Oops. No, no, I don't need a free keynote update. I, what I do need this beginning in my slideshow. There you go. <laughs> okay, cool. So I'm ready to go. Um, and I have that it's just seven o'clock. So I want to welcome you guys to our webinar, Magnetize Your Horse Human Relationship is what it should say. I'm Mary Ann Brewer. I'll be your host uh, for the evening. And this is um, a webinar that I've put together to help people stop the suffering so people can actually uh, have the relationship that you, you got a horse for. That would be my goal for you today. So um, because I'm sharing my screen, I cannot see what's going on in the chat, but I want you to feel free to type your questions in the chat and I will get to them. Um, this uh, webinar will take about an hour and a half. Um, I'm gonna be sharing with you um, some mindset strategies that are gonna help with um, getting your mind right about being with the horses, not just your horse, but all horses. And I'm gonna be sharing um, productive emotion use and how to have that happen. And I'm also gonna be sharing some um, physical strategies with you. And um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a lot of things. Later on, I'm gonna share with you my six month coaching program that I have created um, on this very first day, because we're officially in autumn now, this very first day of autumn 2017. Um, it's a six month coaching program, which means we go right through spring. We get out in the winter and we get it all done. So this is me and my horse Summer and we're here at the beach in New Jersey. Here's some fun and interesting facts. 3.91 million horses live in the United States of America and 84% of those horse owners are women 38 years and older. So chances are, some of you are here. 85% <laughs> of those women horse owners are recreational riders. They are not even people who go to horse shows, which really surprised me. I got this information from the American Horse Council, so they could be wrong, but a lot of that information really surprised me. These are the top three challenges that affect some of that 85% of the horse owning population. Uh, the first one is fear. And that's fear of safety, fear of going fast, fear of being hurt, fear of messing up, fear of doing things wrong, um, and uh, fear that my horse is gonna get hurt. And uh, fitness, my, our own personal fitness challenges as being women who are over 40. And um, conflicting information, information that comes from all sources and we have so, there's information overload and we don't know what to do about it. So I'm actually gonna help right here today and I make you a promise that I'm going to help with those three things. In a little while this is how you're going to be able to get a hold of me so if you manage to bring a, a notebook and pen and paper along with you this is how you're going to get a hold of me but not now, not to worry. Um, I just wanted you to know that there'll be an opportunity at the end for you to see that screen. And let me just say that I'm filled with gratitude right here in the beginning that you're here and um, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, just a little tiny bit about my journey, just so you know how I can help you. Um, my foundation training um, that I spent from 1996 to 2005 is in natural horsemanship. In 2006, I began facilitating equine assisted and psychotherapy sessions, equine assisted learning and psychotherapy sessions, um, along with mental health professionals and um, 
and that was through my work with the organization known as EGALA. And I am an advanced equine specialist who's a mentor for other equine specialists. And um, to date, we have worked with more than 15,000 people in our arena. Um, and I spend all of my days uh, helping people just like you uh, problem solve and um, teaching people and horses how to be safe and have fun together. So we're going to jump right into mindset first because horses are mind readers and there's nowhere to hide. So let's get clear about productive mindset use. So this is the first problem that we're going to solve, fear. And we're going to start with mindset strategies to do it. So back in the early 2000s, I began, a, I began to study, along with many other people, what is common to all human beings, right? It's kind of like what is common to all airplanes. You know, they all can fly and they're all different. So what is common to all human beings? We're all different, but we have a certain set of things in common. But one of the things that I learned is that most of us have what I'm going to call an already and always conversation that's running in the background. And we don't even know that it's happening. It's just like the, it's like wearing rose colored glasses. When you put them on, everything is rose colored. But after a little while, things are just the color they are. You don't even know that they're rose colored anymore. But these already and always conversations, they sound something like I'm not. And then you go ahead and you fill in the blank. Fit enough is a big problem for people, or coordinated enough, or I'm not smart enough, or any of these, like I can't remember, like I can't, I can't track things, I don't remember, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't have the space, I don't have an arena, I don't have the right, and then you fill in the blank, you know, like I don't have, if I only had an arena with a fence, you know, or if I only had the right trailer, or if my trailer was only bigger, I could go places, or if I only had the right truck, or you know, whatever it is, it's always something that's up some, for some reason, I'm just not good enough and I just don't have what it takes. But whatever conversations these are that are running in the background of your own particular situa situation, they're hidden from our view. And whether we know these things are conversations or not, these conversations are affecting our outcome every day in everything that we do. So what do you see when you take a look at your already and always conversation about you as a horse person? Do you see yourself as a lion and you're really a kitten? Or do you see yourself as a kitten? Or, a, as a, or do you see yourself as a kitten when you really are a lion? Most people don't see themselves as they are. They see themselves with these glasses that we put on. These already and always conversations, they're just conversations when we know that they're only conversations. They're kind of like a superstition. It's only a superstition when it's not a superstition. When you know the jig's up, when you know a black cat crossing your path is simply a black cat crossing your path, it has no hold on you. But if you believe that it brings you bad luck, you're going to turn around and you're going to go the other way. See, a superstition's only a superstition when it's not a superstition, when it's the truth. That's how these already and always conversations are. And then there are the already and always beliefs that we have about our horses. And we can fill in these blanks too. My horse is or my horse is not, whichever it is. And we can say, you know, oh, my horse, she's very athletic, very fit, very brave. Or she, we could say she's very dominant or scared of everything. Oh, my horse is herd bound, buddy sour or barn sour. Or worse, we make up all kinds of names for the things that our horses are or are not. But we could say all the things that my horses either do or do not do. My horse doesn't trailer load. My horse doesn't like the rain. My horse doesn't get along with other horses. My horse doesn't like the wind, the bushes, plastic black bags, fly spray. That's a big one, right, as we're coming to the end of the summer. Or my horse simply doesn't like that end of the arena. And then our, there's all the things that our horses need or we can't get done what we need to get done, right? Oh, my horse needs to wear shoes or she needs a particular bit or I have to tie her head down or, it, you know, whatever it is. We need something that we don't have. And even our horses begin to believe this stuff, you know, 
because they're mind readers and they're listening to us and you'll see horses that you know can't go out because it's too hot or too buggy or don't go out in the rain or don't go out in the wind or can't go out because it's snowing or yeah so this quote here is from Henry Ford and what he says is whether you think you can or you think you can't you're right he says it in a lot of ways here this is my student Lauren and one of the things that she said to me one day is um, she wrote a testimonial and she said, I cannot believe I'm riding my racehorse in a rope halter. This is well beyond anything she thought was going to happen. So let's work on mindset that actually supports what we want and not what we don't want. So at the, at the DNA level, Horses are herd animals, and that means that they want to be together. We can use this to magnetize our horses to us. So to do that, we need to learn what our horses like, what our horses need, and what are the things that are actually important to our horses. And they're different. They're not always the same. Every horse is different. This is just what horses do. They quickly assemble in their exact order like these magnets. This is a natural law, like flocks of birds, schools of fish, and herds of horses, a law of nature, and how the law of attraction actually works. Unforeseen forces are running in the background, like our already and always conversations. If we set up the right circumstances, our horses will hurry to assemble in the perfect order, in the perfect time, with us. We need to become who our horses want to be with. We, nerd, we need to learn to speak their language and help our horses learn our language. We wanna become the magnet. To do that, first, we need to be honest about what's going on for us. We need to tell the truth. There is nowhere to hide with horses, so we need to stop trying. If you make a mistake, I want you to clean it up straight away. Don't go down the rabbit hole that's sure to follow and simply commit to improving whatever needs to be improved. Be honest. If we come to our horses with a hidden agenda, they will know it. This is where having a big clear picture, and we're gonna talk more about that later, is so helpful. What is the relationship that you wanna have with your horse? What does it actually look like? What are you actually doing together? Remember all those already and always conversations that are running and potentially hidden from our awareness? These thoughts can show up as incongruent or dishonest to others, especially to horses who are programmed to read the motives of predators. Horses are so sensitive to slight changes that they can detect a shallowing or a shortening of our breath a slight rise in our heartbeat or a constriction in our throat or in our gut. Horses are reading our focus and our energy. They're reading the clock and the weather, and we're teaching them to do it all the time. In short, if you're happy, be happy. If you're sad, be sad. If you're PMSing, be PMSing. If you're in a thoughtful mood, be thoughtful. If you're mad, be mad. Our horses may not be attracted to some of these emotions, but they will be congruent and they'll be easily read by our horses and they'll help us to get honest about what's really going on for us. We don't wanna let things fester and put icing on a mud pie and pretend it doesn't exist. If it's yucky and it's your doing, clean it up straight away. If you feel bad about something, this is your insides telling your outsides that something is not right. We cannot go back in time and fix things. We can go forward in time and commit to fixing things in the future. I'll speak to my horses in plain English. I'll say, you know, I was sorry I was so uncoordinated today. I was really thinking about that webinar I was going to do tonight, and I just wasn't present. And I promise them, when I'm with you, I'll be with you. I am not gonna let other things distract me. I'm gonna be 100% here. And it, maybe they don't understand English, but they do understand the energy, the sentiment, the honesty that's coming from me. 
and they understand when I say, oops, sorry, my bad. We don't want to go down the rabbit hole that's sure to follow. This rabbit hole of making yourself wrong or not good enough or not athletic enough, having no rhythm, somebody who can't pay attention or focus or stay present. If you find yourself there, going down that rabbit hole again of that already and always conversation, clean it up straight away and commit to not giving yourself permission to going down that rabbit hole again. Now, I'm a funny kind of person. I am the, I'm always looking for where did this come from? Where did this, where did down the rabbit hole come from? And it's actually a metaphor for the entry into the unknown and the disorienting place or the mentally deranging place from Alice's adventures in Wonderland, of all things. <laughs> And that's why I always looked up the meaning. I always look up the meaning of words and I looked up the meaning of commitment because I say this a lot, you know, commit to not going down the rabbit hole. And it's really number two here that is interests me. And that is an engagement or an obligation that restricts freedom of action. Like you are not allowed to go down that rabbit hole of I'm not good enough anymore. Once you know that it's a conversation, it no longer will have a hold on you. And then commit to improving whatever is needed. And this goes to number two. And that is the, the biggest issue, one of the biggest issues that people have. They have a fear mindset or a mindset that's not productive. And they have fitness issues. And, and sometimes the fear is related to the fitness issues and they all become one thing. So if you know that you need to lose 10 pounds, commit to improving whatever is needed. Maybe you need to become more athletic. You know, walking three days a week is a really good start. Just go slowly at first and gradually commit to being able to walk five miles three days each week. That'll, that'll change your fitness level. I always use my mom as an example here. My mom was 70 years old when she got this little dog and um, it would uh, run away if she just let it out. So she had to walk it. So she started walking and she couldn't walk very far at first, but soon enough, three days a week, she was out there walking five miles a day. I'm telling you, at 70 years old, she had the calves of a 16-year-old. She had all kinds of energy and air. You know, she was, um, she was fit as a 70-year-old. Um, walking three days a week helps you have more air and have more endu endurance. And we're coming into, you know, the cooler months. We're coming into what's called the dark season, right? If you want to have blood flow to your toes or your fingers, or you want to have a clearer thinking, walking three days a week is going to make a difference for you. And you'll be surprised that just because you're taking ground on that fitness level right now, you'll find yourself making healthier food choices. And elicit the help of a friend. Friends can be very motivating when something comes up or I just don't want to. You could walk with your horse. It's something I love to do. I, I will take every or all of them out for a walk and I just go out around the fields and let them forage on whatever they want. I usually, if you get to see any of my two minute tips that I post on Facebook all the time or on YouTube, it's usually myself, potentially a horse, definitely the, the goat and definitely a dog. <laughs> so we're all uh, in it together. <laughs> Maybe you need to be more focused or coordinated. These are the, some of the things that I did because I knew that I needed to be more focused or more coordinated. Find a weekly yoga class or a martial arts class to help you with feel, timing, and balance. Your horse will thank you for it. Perhaps you need to change your diet to include more water and less caffeine. Maybe you need to add some chamomile tea to your diet. Chamomile tea will help settle your molecules and maybe eliminate some of the coffee. It's really hard for us here, um, you know, in this really fast paced world we live in, you know, to, to even settle ourselves down enough to know that we're really and truly in this space and not thinking of all the things that happened today and all the things that will happen tonight, especially if we board our horses. Sometimes we can get so involved with what's going on at the barn and what happened today and what's happening tonight that it's really hard for us even to be just right there with our horses. And think about practicing your horsemanship while you're not with your horse. 
Um, notice what you do in your daily interactions and how you can relate those patterns to the patterns in your horse interactions. I'm going to um, New York City next week with my friend. We like to go to to these to plays on in on afternoons in the afternoon. And um, one of the ways I practice my horsemanship when I go to the city is I try to focus down the sidewalk and I try to just own my line and see if. I can just walk my line without bobbing and weaving and dodging around all the people. Um, so I like to see where is it that I can own my line and where is it someone else's focus is so much clearer than mine and I'm the one dodging out of the way. So, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm the, I was the girl in the yoga class who was thinking, you know, if I can stand on my head, how much better balance am I going to have for my horse? If I can, if I can just lay my chin on my thighs, how much more flexibility am I going to have for my horse? If I can just bend over and touch my toes, you know, when I was in these, I took some kung. I took uh, two years. I studied kung fu, and when I was in those classes, the reason I was in those classes and the thing I was there doing was to increase my feel and timing because you're always playing Kung Fu with a live person. And I wanted to have better feel and better timing. And, you know, somebody else was always better than me. So I would always look to see where can I have better feel or better timing? Where can I have better balance in this class? I'm famous for saying everything is really everything else. And that's why I say practice your horsemanship away from your horse by noticing what you're doing in your daily interactions and relating those patterns to patterns in your horse interactions. Yeah, summertime's a great time for outdoor exercise, but so is autumn and winter. Don't get stuck that it's cold because we're coming into that season. And you know, avoid making the same mistakes over and over. Learn to become a keen observer. If you've got a notebook and you've, you've got something to write with, um, write this down. You can't, you can't click on this because it's a webinar, but this is the link to my free ebook on my website, mariambrewer.com, called For the Love of Horses. It's just a 16 page um, free ebook lesson, and it's on becoming a keen observer and busting the myth of the horse whisperer. Um, Horse whisperers really are people who are keen observers. They're people who pay attention. Um, it's an easy lesson and it'll make a big difference. Um, and I'm gonna ask, have you become an avoidaholic? And the way to recovery is hire a private one-on-one -on -one horseman co horsemanship coach. And that's my pitch for my program I'm gonna talk to you in a bit about. But first, I want to give you some encouragement to live the dream that you got a horse for. Because you might be feeling right now like, wow, there, I, got, I got a lot of stuff going on. I was very young when I got married and started having children. I was just 18. And it wasn't until I was in my early 40s that I sold my business. I rented out my farm and I set out on an amazing journey across the United States with my girl, Miss Patches, there. Um, this was a long time dream come true and it only happened because I did personal mindset work and I got coaching on what I wanted and I became in unstoppable in the pursuit of it. I was unwilling to live any longer doing what I didn't want to do. I knew that while I was at work, all I talked about was horses. All I thought about was horses. All I wanted to know was what was natural to horses. So I spent the first three months of this year, this was in 2005, um, traveling uh, from New Jersey down to Florida. And we stayed there in Florida for a while. And then we traveled across the bottom of the United States. That took us about six weeks. We climbed up into um, Southern Colorado after camping all over the Southern United States. It was great. You know, I would I would, we would camp and sometimes there was like a B and B for you and your horse and we would stay there or we would stay in a fairground and um, I would put my horse in a stall and I would pitch my tent right outside of her stall or, um, you know, wherever it was, I always stayed right with her. Um, but it was, it was a wonderful adventure. We rode everywhere, every day. We rode everywhere every day because we took a long time to travel o over to Colorado into the beautiful San Juan Mountains, where it was actually winter when we got there. And there's a picture of us with kind of winter in the back, background and in the foreground. 
we had amazing adventures there in the mountains and we made many friends, both horse and human and mule. And we learned a lot. In the middle of year, the year, um, my second horse was able to join us in Colorado because I'd gotten into the university and I was able to do a cult start and uh, bring my second horse from home. So she was shipped out to us. And then we spent the rest of the summer there in Colorado. And in the fall, um, the, the crew of us all traveled um, back through the middle of the country. And then we went back down into Florida and we spent the rest of uh, the year there in Florida. And we came home back here to New Jersey just in time for Christmas. So we were gone that entire year. And while we were gone, these are some of the things that I did. Um, so the top right picture there, that's my girl, Jessie. She's the girl that I started in my cult start when I was in the university. The picture on the left there is a picture of me while I was in the university. It's, you see that kind of pre-dawn hue that's in that picture? That's because everything we did seemed to be before breakfast. It was always very early and that's I was on the feed team there and that was actually a great big giant um, cement mixer we would put all the food and all the supplements and all this water in there and we'd turn that thing on and we were feeding 64 horses before breakfast um, so that was a lot of them. so you were either on when you got into the university you were either on the feed team or the cleanup team so feed was uh, after jingle and then cleanup now jingle was my first rotation and the jingle team is where you um, you you show up in the in the pasture in the ten acre pasture. You find your horse in the pitch dark because let me just tell you, there's no light out in Southern Colorado. It is not like here in New Jersey where there's kind of always some light. No, there's no light. So you go out and somehow by feel and smell you find your horse, and you saddle her up in the dark with your team. There was four of us on the team or three of us on our team and you head out to the mountains to the 200 acre where all the horses um, were turned out, all the ranch horses, any horse that wasn't a student's horse or wasn't currently, um, that a student wasn't using. So all the ranch horses and all the colts from the colt start were out there. And it, as it turned out, the colts from the previous colt start had just gotten turned out into that 200 acre. So while the horses are pattern animals and they kind of learn that once, you know, sometime early in the morning, somebody's going to come and get them and bring them in for breakfast. These colts didn't know that yet. So while we had maybe 50 horses that we um, were bringing in, you know, like 10 of them were hidden. So we'd have to go find them. And we, we didn't, you know, nobody separated. Somebody stayed and held the herd and two other people went out to find the rest of the horses. And so there were real predators there, you know, there were mountain lions and bear and we always saw elk. I mean, there was always, um, there was always uh, wildlife, you know, where I stayed in my cabin, I, I stayed, um, I stayed just above the San Juan River and right across the river, there was elk there every morning and every evening. It was just a, it was a real wild experience. It was a wild adventure and I learned a lot. Um, and then the photo there on the right is when I came home, this was in early 2006, uh, when we started providing equine assisted psychotherapy uh, sessions. And this was one of my equine friends. I like to say that's my Jackie girl and she is an angel who wore that donkey suit. But this is Angie, she's the horse who went um, with me. The picture on the top, um, top right was when we were in Florida and we were learning about fitness. Um, so that was in a fitness program we were in. The bottom right is her when she was just a baby. You can see where she got her name now, her patches of winter. Can you see the snow on the dirt? It kind of looks like her body. And then that's her on the left as well. Um, we were actually together for 27 years. And um, she passed away in the fall. It'll be coming uh, in November. It'll be a year uh, but she was the reason I shifted and did everything different. And maybe you have a horse in your life is the reason you're doing everything different now, or you need to look for a new way. Because it's usually one horse that comes along that the status quo doesn't work anymore. What we know is not sufficient to help this horse. And we look for something new. So um, a new chapter of 
dance and art began in my life. So when we finished school and I began, um, and I came home and I began to help people in horses, um, I helped people have safe, be safe and have fun and, and learn to be confident and feel peaceful in their horse human relationships. And, you know, I began that journey of kind of stopping the suffering for people. And I discovered a new love. I had a life changing experience at Cavalia. So if you've ever been to Cavalia, you'll know what I'm talking about. Cavalia is like Cirque du Soleil with horses. There's live music, theater lighting, people in amazing flowing costumes with horses. And um, a woman who I later actually got to meet and work with, she came out on the stage in these amazing flowy clothes with these beautiful nine Arabian stallions completely at liberty, no strings attached. I was so mesmerized by the connection, um, the communication, the beauty, the all the music. I just, I kept having to like wipe the water out of my face because I was so moved uh, to tears about just the beauty and the connection and all of this. And I just, this really expanded my view of what was possible inside of working with many horses at one time. I really began to learn that there's power in being with multiple horses, that, they, that there wasn't with just one horse. And I really began to learn how one horse and one human can be very powerful together. I learned when I came home that many people um, didn't really know how to have a relationship with their horses at liberty or in groundwork, if the horse wasn't ridden or it couldn't be ridden for whatever reason, it was simply put out to pasture. And this was happening more and more uh, to more and more horses at increasingly young, increasingly young ages. And I just knew that I could help. I knew that I could help people and horses find life outside of riding if that's not what they wanted to do. So I found this picture on the internet. This was one of those pictures from Cavalia. It's like a fantasy, right? Look at this little woman. She's like, come on boys, nine Arabian stallions just following her. I was just, these horses are magnetized and I wanted to know how to do this. So, you know, we need to train our minds to give us what we want. So this, is, this goes to work on number one and number two, you guys, right? This is how to help overcome fear. And this is how to have us have, reach our fitness goals and reach our mental and emotional ability um, as older people, as older women, to um, really have the dream we got a horse for. So we want to use our inner picture. And we want to create thoughts that support what we want. We want to take the time to picture exactly what we want and notice all the details. So Napoleon Hill, in his book, Think and Grow Rich, it's a mindset book, um, which is how I, I thought about it when I read the book. Um, and that's common to me. You know, it's about, it's a money mindset. But I was like, yeah, how does this relate to my horsemanship? <laughs> um, so this girl, she's standing there picturing and, and imagining and visioning her whole routine before she gets on it. Even like the shape of her foot and the, you know, the flare of her fingers. Where is her gaze going to be? She's really intently looking at it, right? So Napoleon Hill teaches us that our minds, our subconscious minds are always being seeded. They're like a garden. And every single thing that comes into our field gets seeded into that subconscious mind. Whether it's their seeds we want, like this girl is cultivating the seeds she wants, or seeds we don't want, which become weeds. And sometimes when we, when we, when we feed and water the weeds, which are the pictures that we don't want. They are what cloud our mind and we can't even get to the pictures we do want. This happens. So another way we can help weed the garden of our mind is visualizing. So not just when we're standing there ready to go and get on the balance beam, 
But when we're not with our horses, picturing, writing down as clearly as possible, imagining with emotion, what is it we want our ride to look like? Now, when we look at this girl in this picture and she's imagining riding like that, she clearly looks very happy, right? She's seeing it in her mind's eye and she's smiling. She's added emotion to it. And I'm gonna make up that she's just writing down what it is that she wants. We wanna keep putting information in so we can oversee the weeds with what we want. Now, this is more my picture. I'd like to ride this horse with all this mane. I could just wrap it around me like a seatbelt and go trotting along on the beach, bareback and bridalist. Feels great to me. Might be more your picture, not sure. <clears throat> And you know, a beginner's mindset is really useful for learning this way of thinking, new things, even if, or I wanna say especially if you're not new to horses. Taking on the thinking of a beginner's mind can help overcome images in your mind that don't support your desired pictures. You wanna wonder where are your images coming from? Because they can not only, they don't have to be something you experienced. They can be, you can form pictures in your mind that end up in the weeds back there and they get tangled up and they can be things maybe you saw, maybe they happened to you, but maybe somebody told you a story one time. Like I have a client who got a brand new horse and it was a lovely horse, it was doing everything she wanted and she never didn't have any trouble with it at all. But we were out riding and there's, um, rails to trails nearby, like where they take out old railroad tracks and they put walking and bicycle paths in. So we were out riding on those trails and she saw a person with a bicycle coming and she jumped off her horse. And I said, oh, what happened? And she said, oh, nothing. I just, what if she's afraid of the bicycle? And I said, well, what made you think she might be afraid of the bicycle? She goes, well, nothing. But someone told me one time, well, be careful because she might be afraid of bicycles. When she first got her horse, because one day her horse was afraid of bicycles. So this isn't even something that ever happened. It's not something she saw happen, but it's something somebody told her could potentially be a problem. And now she's got that in her mind and she's, the sunlight's in there and it's raining on it. And that way those weeds are growing because she's out not even noticing if her horse is even concerned about the bicycle and she's already making up that it will be. So you see how that can happen? Oh, kids, kids have great imaginations. And there's two kinds of imaginations, right? There's this thoughtful imagination, and that's the thoughtful imagination I was just telling you about. It's imagination that comes from thought or what we already know. And then there's our creative imagination, and that comes from pure creativity. And it usually comes from some sort of an an inspiration or a feeling. Some people will say to me, oh, I had an inspiration in the shower today. Um, and kids are good at this. Kids are great at having creative imaginations that come from pure inspiration, not something they ever saw. But what we need to do, if we don't have any kids in our lives, because kids are super for helping us get out of our thinking and into our creative imagination, help us go and be playful with our horses. Horses and kids are naturals together for that reason. Think of imagination as any faculty that can be strengthened and expanded. It can be cultivated and harvested when it produces new fruit. Allow your creative imagination to run wild and free and then add your thinking imagination to guide your pictures. Practice this until you can create the picture you want on demand. Now, I purposely did not put a picture here because I really want you to pay attention to how to use your imagination to give you what you want and not take you down a road that you don't want to be on. Okay? So you use your creative imagination. You just let it run wild and free. You do not censor it. You can write and just imagine, what is it like? What does your clear picture look like? How, what is the fantasy? What is the dream you got a horse for? 
Write that stuff all down. And then you can let your thinking imagination help you to create it. How could it possibly get done? Solve the problems. And then you want to be the energy that you want to attract. This is a really important one. You know, well, let me show you. So these are some pictures. The next few pictures are some pictures from um, students in workshops. This is a big horse, right? And so the goal here was that you were supposed to try to keep slack in your lead rope and match pace and lead. So you wanted to match your horse's energy, pace with them, and then eventually have your horse match your energy, right? That was the goal. And she was just exhausted because they were both finally standing still. I had to snap their picture. She was so happy because they were finally standing still. Now these two, he was trying to help his off the track thoroughbred settle but he has so much energy that it took a really long time. And even in this photo, can you see how her energy, is she standing still and he's still in motion? Like that's how hard it was. And we don't even know when that stuff is actually happening. We look at our horse and say, yeah, she won't settle. She just wants to go. Yeah, but what's happening over here is you can't settle either. You just wanna go too. So we wanna be the energy we wanna attract this is where getting honest about stuff really is what's necessary. We need to get grounded in reality. We need to become keen observers so we can actually see what's happening, not just live in our rose-colored glasses about what we think is happening. Now, this is interesting, right? Look at this. this these three have matched energy. Even their footfalls have matching energy. And what's interesting here is this was, not, this was in a, this was in a, a team-building workshop. This was in a personal development workshop, and these people were working on team. Like, they didn't know each other when they got here. They didn't know these horses. And these people managed to have matched energy. Look, all their left feet are forward. All their right feet are coming forward. It's just totally matched energy. That's what we want. That's called harmony. We want to be the energy we want to attract. Control forward and inside of the boundaries, inside of the boundaries, maybe not a hula hoop, but inside of the boundaries of the parameters. What are they? Are they online? Are they in a corral? Are they simply walking out together? Are, they, are we riding? You know, what are the boundaries? So we've got the fantasy, right? The picture on the top right. We've got the fantasy. What is it? What is it that we want? And then we want to really imagine the picture, write it down, daydream about it, you know, really dwell in it, add the emotion to it, add the energy that we want. Like, what does it feel like? You know, she's clearly happy there. And then we need to really add the desire to pursue actually owning that picture. A strong desire is a powerful motivator. And I'm talking about a strong desire. It has to be more than a mere want to. You know, um, what I know about horses and horse people is this. When there is no fun, there are no funds. The funds, the money, dry up and go away when people are not having fun, when all it is is work and fear. You have to have a desire to have something more than that to actually live the dream you got a horse for. So um, I had an animal communication workshop and um, it was a fundraising event for my nonprofit corporation. And um, the animal communicator talked to Miss Patches, right? She's my Angie, the horse who went, we went on our big journey across the country together. We went away to horsemanship school one of the things she told the animal communicator is that she liked to go here to this place. So that's when I say we both like the serenity of the Pine Barrens. I know it to be true because the, uh, the animal communicator talked with her and uh, she, she described this place for me. She said, it's just 20 minutes away. You go right out of the driveway. It's just 20 minutes away. I thought that was funny, right? She knew when we go left out of the driveway, we go to work. When we go right out of the driveway, we go on a trail ride. So she knew that. Uh, the Pine Barrens is a unique ecosystem in the world, and it's home to many plants and animals that only live here in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. And I say, can you smell the water? Because it's another place, another sense I really want you to fill up, filling up our senses in 
filling up all of our senses is an important part of completing the picture of what we really want. Now, I was saying that this is cedar water to somebody and they thought it was a typo. I was writing it's cedar water, but it's not a typo. The water is actually kind of, you see the color of it? It's actually it's called Matterhorn. The color is like a deepish reddish brown. And it has, a, it has, there are so many cedar trees in the Pine Barrens that the water has a sediment in it and it actually floats in the water. You can actually see it in the water. That's what gives it this color. And like if you go swimming in it and you come out, it'll be on all the hairs. All, you know, you can just wipe it right off. It doesn't stain, it doesn't stain your clothes or anything, but it smells heavily like cedar. So it's another piece of filling up our senses. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What are our emotions? What happens to our emotions? What does it smell like? What happens to our insides, you know, when we're, when we're there? What, is the, what are the sounds of the pine lands? Like it's gotten dark here at home because it's, it's now dark and I can, I can still hear all the crickets and bugs outside, all the katydids. What does it sound like? To feel alive and happy in nature with your horse in a serene place can be a mighty motivator. And apparently 85% of horse owner, owners are recreational riders. So this kind of thing is something people love to do. And so do I. This is what makes me happy. So what do you desire with your horse? So I had a strong desire and I had a clear picture. This is my horse Sterling. And when I got him as a baby, I wanted him to lay down when I asked. I didn't want to use ropes. I didn't want, I just wanted to say, you know, I just wanted to give him some signals to just lay down. And I wanted him to say, yes, I would love to. So I began to reinforce his ideas of laying down and rolling because they were becoming a habit. Every day I would come out to feed him and he would lay down and roll. And I thought, okay, I'm going to just reinforce that, which meant I'm just going to feed him when he's laying down and rolling and reward him for that. So I did that for a little bit. And then I thought every day when I came out, he would like lay down and he would just look at me like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here, right? I'm laying down. And I thought, hmm, what else can I do with that? And so I thought, all right, because I was, I had walked all the way away and I see him, I, I come back and he's sitting so tall. And I thought, well, let me see if I can just ask him to go back a little bit and then wait. And then he got himself to this sitting position. And so I kept rewarding that. And so for seven days in a row, I would go out, he would lay down and then he would push himself up into a sit. <laughs> so now the horse sits and lays down and rolls over <laughs> with all the things the dog does. <laughs> Um, this is a story about a woman who I met, and she told me this story personally. Um, she had lost 150 pounds so that she could ride in her daughter's fancy Western show saddle. It was a gift for her daughter that turned out to be a true gift for herself. She never told anyone what she was doing, but the woman was obese, and she made a commitment to herself to lose weight, to buy a horse, to learn to ride, and to put this fancy Western show saddle on the horse and show in Western pleasure classes. The story was eventually featured in Western Horseman, the magazine, but she was unreasonable. She did not let the reasons from her past or the reasons that she was obese stop her in the present. This took a mindset shift. But our minds are set up to give us what we want and do the work to have. See, she had a strong desire. That fancy Western show saddle was a mighty motivator for her. And I said, she was unreasonable, right? And I want you to be unreasonable? Yeah, that's what I mean to say. Because reasons for things happening often get in the way. Good ones and bad ones. Reasons come from the past, they can affect the present, and we wanna see if we really want them to affect the future. If we've made a commitment to walk three days each week and there's only two days left, and we haven't walked because of the weather, this is an example of being reasonable. In this case, being unreasonable would help us cover some ground on the fitness level we want. And a place where having someone counting on us could make a big difference. Have you ever seen people out running in the rain? Or they're out running in the heat and I think, oh my gosh, how can you run in this heat? Or they're out running in the snow? Yeah, they have a goal. 
So you know what? I didn't know what I didn't know. And most of us don't. You know, we don't know what we don't know. We only know what we know. And we don't even know that sometimes. So um, I live here in New Jersey. And in New Jersey, it's really common for people to create these square, square pens of varying sizes, whether they're two acres or 20 acres or, or you know, 100 by 100 to keep their horses in. And so that's what I did. I had, I always wanted more land. Uh, so I had more space for the horses to go. Uh, but I only had seven acres. And it was after I came home from so horsemanship school that I had a big mindset shift. See, while I was away at school, my horse, she, she could go up and down um, mountains and she could walk on the sides of cliffs and she could, uh, we could get, we could walk up the back of an easy mountain and then come straight down the front of a mountain that had all this gravel. It was called Scooch Mountain. And you just kind of, you kind of walk the horse's front feet and you sit back real far and the horse's back end just kind of slides down the mountain. Like when I realized my horse could do these things and she was brave and smart and fit and athletic. And I thought, what else can I do at home? You see, I have this creek and it runs right through the middle of my property. And I always used it as a barrier. Instead, I fenced it in and I started using it as an obstacle for the horses to choose whether they wanted to go in it or not. Now you see, they all go right in it. You see how deep it gets. And they go in it because the front lawn is a mighty motivator. The front lawn has all this lush front lawn grass. And I don't always let the horses go out there because it is the front lawn. I kind of don't want it to look like a pasture. Um, but it has wonderful grass. They all, when I open it up and I let them go out, they can't wait to go down that steep, muddy bank and into that deep water. That little horse, she has to swim at some point and then climb up the deep, muddy bank on the other side because they all want to be in the front lawn. Watch this little one. You can hardly see her because there's other horses in the way, but they never step on her or anything. Yeah, there's, there's a deep hole right there. She has to go in it. Yeah, up and down. So, so now I have horses that, not one of my horses has any problem going up and down steep banks, through muddy areas, into deep water, crossing creeks. I mean, we help countless horses on the trail who can't go through water because they, don't, they know that it's fine. They can go through water and they can be safe with it. And then on the top right over there, what I did was I made a track system. So I made a track system that closely mirrors a natural horse path, um, if you will. Like if you've ever been walking out in the forest and you've come upon a deer path, right? Or even in your, in your pasture, you might actually have paths that are worn where the horses go all the time. Um, and so that's what is natural, that horses walk, walk essentially on a track system. So um, the top right picture, like I've got my mares on the outside of the track and they surround my stallion and gelding that are on the inside of the track. And they can go pretty much all over the property together, just separated by that fence. So it's the most natural environment that I can have and keep my horses all together without having uh, babies. And then the bottom right photo is how I feed the horses and I feed them in these small mesh uh, hay nets. And um, I put these all over the track and they go from one to the other eating. So my strong desire to have more land was fulfilled when I actually started looking at my property in a new way. You know, like I said, I didn't know what I didn't know. And then when I saw, when I really saw what I had, it changed everything. obviously thinking about a thing that was not enough to bring it for, to fruition and whether or not you want to change your whole property to have a track system or you simply want your horse to wait there in the doorway with the gate open while you go across the hall and you go into the tack room and you get his tack to tack him up. It doesn't matter what the thing is that you want, but thoughts by themselves aren't enough. Thoughts and actions need to work in concert with one another to bring the dream you got a horse for to life. And sometimes that takes a different point of view. It's because we don't know what we don't know. And in, 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 for me, the way that I help people is not 
I don't need you to be like me. I don't want you to want what I want. I want you to want what you want. Only I want you and your horse to be the best you and your horse can be and have the things you want. Maybe you do want to go to the horse show or you want to go to a hunter pace or you want to trail ride or you want to go camping or you just want to be safe and have fun in your own backyard with your horse. Whatever it is, you know, tomorrow's not a promise for any of us. You know, when we start getting a little older, you know, we start, like I have a lot of retired friends. And sadly enough, I have a lot of friends that are dead. You know, I, I, I had a 54 year old friend that just died of a heart attack the other day. Like I, I just don't live like tomorrow's not a promise because it, it's not, it's not. I mean, for some people it's just not coming. Today is all we have. Yeah, so when a, a thing is important to you, it will become important to your horse. When you assign the proper importance to your desires, your horse is gonna step right in that picture with you. I've, I see it happen every day. So in my herd, um, I use my horses, um, you know, for some of them are riding horses and some of them only do equine assisted psychotherapy or learning. And um, um, one of the things that's important to me is that I can uh, introduce food and be safe. Um, so as long as everyone is experiencing safety, I can go, this isn't even me actually, um, people can go out into the, my pasture and hand out mints, you know, and open them up in their noisy packages and have the whole herd standing there waiting for their turn. It wasn't always this way, but this became something that was important to me. So I taught my horses that you wait and you wait for me to hand it to you because I will hand it to you. I want you to have these things, but you need to wait because I didn't want horses in my, that were loose and free in an arena with people who don't know anything about horses. Maybe they bring a cough drop out of their pocket and I, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, it gets crazy. So this is another thing that was important to me. I do believe in feeding treats and I think there's nothing more natural in the world than horses who are browsers and grazers to be eating treats and no, they don't act inappropriately about it. And you can see everyone is safe. You see the little horse standing right in the middle of the entire herd. And she's not like a tough bossy little horse either. She's just an amicable friendly little horse. This can happen anywhere. And we get here through principles instead of rules. And this is, this is the answer to number three, the biggest problem that people experience with their horses, and that's conflicting information. When we work through um, all the conflicting information and we filter it through principles, this is how we become problem solvers. This is how we become somebody who actually has a thought process not based on what somebody else thinks, but a thought process based on what is the big picture here? What is the big overarching umbrella of principles that we live under? And, and I'm saying principles, and I'm saying that as opposed to rules, right? So I was with a client today, and um, she has a lovely horse, it's very well trained, just a beautiful, beautiful uh, quarter horse who knows his job really, really well. And, um, and, and he was taught that, um, you know, when she walks forward at his shoulder or his neck, he should walk forward with her. And that when she stops and backs up, he should stop and back up. Essentially, he was taught to always keep her kind of right there at his, you know, neck behind his head and in front of his shoulder. Beautiful, right? It's very, very nice. Except if she wants to walk behind him and have him move forward, he, he can't do it. He just comes, he just like has to put her right back in that spot because that's the rule, right? So there's not anything wrong with that unless you want to walk in some other area. And the groundwork that I teach is groundwork that transfers to riding. So I actually want people in the riding area, which is further back than the shoulder. And that presents a problem for a horse that's been taught the rules. But it's the same thing as any other thing. Like if the if we if we live under this overarching uh, umbrella of principles, we can teach a horse to keep slack in the lead row, or stay what I put you, or maintain gait, maintain direction, and that can take care of um, cross ties or any leading problems or um, any any tying problems that we might have. Like if we simply keep, teach a horse to maintain gait, maintain direction, 
That means go over there, stand there, and wait. Just wait right there, right? That's maintain gate, maintain direction. The gate is stopped. Don't turn around. Just wait right there. I mean, in all honesty, that horse should wait there until we ask him to do something else. But if we don't give him the opportunity to be responsible for waiting because we've put him on cross ties, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything's bad with cross ties or anything's wrong with tying a horse up. But what if we lived in these principles that actually gave him responsibilities? So here's, some, here's some more examples of these principles. Another one is I want to just say, assume he will instead of he will not. Um, um, reward the try. That's a principle because your horse will try harder. Expect your horse to be in communication. Look for it and listen for it and respond to it. Be willing to share your ideas and feelings and imagination with your horses. And come from a place of gratitude, assuming he will instead of he will not. It goes a long way. If we're thinking, oh, he's a no, then guess what? He's going to be a no. And, you know, people, women, especially ladies, I'm talking to you, women need to own their space with their horses. Um, it's not just, not just women, men too. But people need to own their space with their horses. I cannot tell you how often I'm standing talking to a client and the whole time the horse is pushing on him and pushing on him and pushing on him and the human is backing away and backing away and backing away. Instead of asking the horse to just stand over there, you stand over there. I'm not going to push on you. You're not going to push on me. We're going to have a little powwow and talk here. You know, I mean, if we can teach our horse that, our whole life is going to be more pleasant, plus we're going to be safer because we've taught our horse to stand over there. I'm gonna show you how to do that in a little minute. We wanna use the natural laws of attraction by creating the pictures, feelings, and energy and desires in our dreams. And we need to be clear about them. And we wanna let our Grinch heart grow. So this comes from the story of Dr. Seuss's story about how the Grinch stole Christmas, right? You remember? So the Grinch went down on Christmas Eve and he stole Christmas, right? The boxes and bows and the roast beasts and the trees and all that. And he got it up there on his mountain. And in the morning, he was waiting and he was, you know, waiting for the Who's and Whoville to come out and wail and sigh and cry. But instead, what happened was he heard them singing. And when he heard them singing, he was so surprised that his heart grew three sizes that day, right? And such that even his little dog felt his heart growing. Like that's what I want for you and your horse. I want you to observe changes in your horse that demonstrate that they're feeling your gratitude, even if you don't say good boy or hand him a cookie. Like I want your body language to be so clear and so expressive that when you're feeling happy and satisfied about something, he knows it. So often we get so stuck in concentration, we can't move forward. Gratitude, it's a prescription for what ails us. Take a dose every morning. It may cause a shift in perspective. It may cause feelings of abundance and it may decrease feelings of fear and anxiety. So just like we get into habits of are already are already and always conversations like are already and always thoughts that are there we get habit in, into habits of thinking feeling and moving together with our horses and this is another one of those places that's potentially hidden from our view we're not we don't even know what we do we don't even know how we're moving with our horses or how we're interacting with our horses so the question is, is how do we handle one another? Are we always pulling on one another? Because I see that all the time. And there's even rules about that, right? The horse has to stay behind you. You have to go first. You know, um, yeah. And this also addresses our issue number one again of fear, right? Because if we're always pulling on our horses that means they're behind us for one thing but we're not giving them responsibilities so we're not trusting them we're taking all the responsibility 
and not even allowing them to have it. So not only is there fear of failure in that, fear of getting hurt in that, fear of them getting hurt in that, fear of messing things up in that. It's huge. It's a big umbrella of rules that cause all this fear. Horses do not pull on one another. Horses push on one another. And so if we're going to be more horse-like, we're going to need to start pushing on one another and stop pulling. Here's the one case where horses do pull on one another. It's when we put these wide web flat halters on these horses and then we pull against them and they play halter tag and they play tug of war with these things. But that's not what we're going to do. Here's examples of horses pushing. Okay, these are physical strategies I want you to pay attention to. So first we see, so this is my young stallion. He's a colt at the time. He was probably two at the time, uh, the gray horse. And then this is my gelding that he um, lived with. And, um, and you can see he's, he's pushing on him, right? He's pushing on his hindquarters there. And the gelding delivered a communication that that colt needed and could hear. He wasn't being mean. He wasn't being nasty. He was saying, hey, back off, buddy. Quit pushing on me. And then we see the third picture there where the colt saying, I, yeah, I got to go. He did not connect. He did not kick him. And there we are back to grazing. No harm done. Right. The gelding, you see him. He's not holding a grudge and being mad and chasing him all over the arena with some stick. And it's not he's not yelling. He's just back to grazing. It's done. It's over. And the colt's like, wow, did you see that? Because there I am out there taking a picture. He's like, oh, what happened? So here's an example of me. This is a me, um, a terrible picture. It, it wasn't always this fuzzy, sorry about that. Um, but me um, pushing on my horse. So uh, can you see I'm moving toward the horse and the horse is moving away? Can you see all the slack in the lead rope that's around that horse's neck? So I'm pushing with intended pressure. It's not physical, I have not touched her but it's energetic pressure. So there's a lot of ways to talk to our horses. It's not always gonna be physical. Can you see her, her left ear right on me? And she's just softly moving away. She's not escaping. She's not rushing away from fear. I'm not walking into her. There's just harmony and communication here. Here's another example. Can you see the focus of the human? The gaze is directly at that trailing foot. And that rope probably just touched that foot. Can you see that horse's right ear completely in communication on the human? Can you see there's still slack in the lead rope coming out of my right hand? Can you see the slack in the lead rope around her neck? So the horse has an available place to move into and she's doing a really nice job of just taking her responsibility of receiving this soft energy and communication and responding without fear or worry. It's just harmony, she's just in communication. All I wanted for was that trailing foot to pull up underneath her, just a little bit further, just to ask her to carry herself a little bit more. You know, ask her to have a posture that was a little bit nicer than leaning on that front right hoof. Once we're good at pushing instead of pulling horses and being more horse-like, we can actually be in front, so there I am in front of another horse, and I'm actually pushing the energy around from behind. You know, soon enough you're actually able to arc energy in all directions from anywhere. And you, won't, you won't need a rope, you won't need any kind of a tool, you're just gonna be so good at moving your energy and projecting your energy that your horse can feel it. Horses are that good. We see it happen every day all the time. Watch them. They can look at another horse and toss their head and the other horse will just move off. Or they can draw them to them. They can say, hey, come on over here and they can draw them right to them. There's no reason why we can't do any of that. It's just that we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what's actually possible until we start exploring. You know, taking the time that it takes to teach our horses actually makes it take less time. And I say that because, you know, I used to be I mean, I used to be a person who would not fix things in the moment. I mean, who's not pressed for time? Everyone is, right? 
I used to spend time doing things repeatedly that didn't work, but now if I see a thing's not working, I just take the time and I teach what I want and I use principles to do it and I do it right away. Because what I know is before I know it, years will slip by and I'll still be dealing with that exact same thing if I don't deal with it today. And remember, tomorrow's not a promise. I deal with it whether I'm dressed for it, whether it's snowing or it's hot or I don't have the time or I don't want to. I, I, I address stuff. I do not let it go unspoken. I don't let it get untalked about with my horses. You know, I address stuff that comes up right away. And it, it's made a huge difference in my horsemanship, I have to say. Tomorrow's not a promise for any of us. Taking the time to teach our horses makes everything take less time. Slow and right beats fast and wrong. We look for gimmicks and gadgets and the quick fix and the piecemeal approach to fixing our problems with our horses. And all we get is a little bit better, maybe, maybe not. You know, we, we try things, they don't work. We don't have the help or support we need. And then we give up on that thing. And before you know it, we've got a stack of DVDs or a hundred, you know, videos in our inbox, or we've got a stack of magazines or books. And, you know, maybe some things are better, but we're still not living the dream we got a horse for. So here's where we are so far, right? We want to be more horse-like, right? And so if we want to do that, we need, this is a bird's eye view, by the way. <laughs> we want to get clear about our internal dialogue and beliefs about our horses. And we want to let that stuff go, that already and always stuff about ourselves and our horses. You are good enough, and so is your horse, to live exactly the dream that you want to have with you and your horse. We want to learn to tell the truth. There's no place to hide. The horses already know. They're mind readers. You know, it just shows up as incongruency. We want to commit to improve whatever needs to be improved, and we want to be unreasonable about that commitment. We want to create our inner pictures, add feelings, add energy and desire. We want to use thoughtful and creative imagination. We want to use principles instead of rules. And we want to push instead of pull. So now we want to look to see what is our horse's point of view? How do things actually look from their perspective? Imagine if you were this tall. <laughs> right? They have a different point of view. Horses are built to be sensitive. Many horses have huge nostrils and noses that are 18 inches long, with eyes that are set on both sides of their head, giving them near 360 degrees of vision, and ears that telescope in almost all directions. Horses are set up to take notice. Being quadrupeds and so big, with four feet on the ground and long bodies that cover that are covered with sensitive skin and they're woven together by sensitive fascia. Horses notice, do you know what fascia is? Fascia is a, like a spider web that holds all the muscles in shape. It lives under the skin, in, under, their, under our body. It's very, very sensitive stuff. How horses can feel a mosquito land on their hip and shake it and have it you know, go away. Four feet on the ground. I don't want to overlook how important that is. Do you see how much ground this horse is covering from her nose to her tail? Horses are equipped to see, hear, and smell far better than humans. We want to listen to what they have to say instead of making the assumption that they're just being oppositional. You know, the horse doesn't want to go to that end of the arena. Maybe there's a reason why. Maybe those huge nostrils and those 18 inch long noses actually know something that we don't know with this little thing we've got on our face. I mean, most people's noses aren't even an inch. You know, your, your nostrils are not more than a finger width wide. Horses are set up to notice. There's definitely stuff they know that we don't know. Horses live outside. Here in New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy back in 2012, a lot of roads and, roads and bridges, they washed out. And I was out riding uh, with my trail riding friends, and all of a sudden the horses wouldn't go. They just stopped. And so I got off my horse, and I walked ahead of her, and a good 100 yards out in front of us, like around the bend, we couldn't see this. The road and the bridge was completely washed away. There was like water rushing through where there used to be a road. 
I think it's those four feet on the ground that had them know that there was danger ahead. I mean, really think about it. I mean, they live, they're living outside all the time. Even if they're going into a barn, they're on the ground, their feet are on the ground, right? Ours aren't like, even right now, like I'm sitting in my sunroom that sits, I, I walk up four steps to get in my house and my sunroom sits on a crawl space. So there's nothing here touching the ground. I spend a lot of time in my house. I ride in my car. I go into buildings. I walk on concrete and pavement. I mean, I'm not spending time with my four feet on the ground and my nose on the ground for 20 hours a day doing nothing but paying attention to how the earth feels. Can you hear me? That makes a huge difference. I one time was in a... I was in a, at a healing retreat and we were doing a meditation on the beach and uh, somebody was going to play, um, you know, singing bowls. They're, they're very, very beautiful. They're made out of lots of different metals and they, you, you, uh, you can make them sing and they're wonderful. And I wanted to listen. And so the bowl um, was not on the ground, but I turned my ear to lay on the sand next to a tree. And interestingly enough, all I could hear was road noise. And we were very far from the road. You know, we were probably a good mile or more through the woods, probably more from the road. But all I could hear was road noise. So we don't really know what horses know. But when they tell us something, we need to pay attention to that. We need to listen and not make them wrong for it. Now, we have an ability to reason. And we have an ability, like, I live in New Jersey. And we don't have mountain lions that are going to jump out of the bushes and get us. You know, chances are we don't have predators that are going to eat our horses, right? So I have an ability to reason with that and know that, you know, and I need to impart that information, but I do need to listen to what they're telling me. We need to see things from a different perspective. Every horse deserves to be treated with dignity and honor, and every horse deserves the opportunity to learn to get along in our world and not labeled. You know what they label donkeys? This was the most compliant being on the planet. That's not the reputation donkeys have. Every horse is absolutely in communication. Every horse learns who will listen to them and who will not. Horse whisperers are really horse listeners. Horse listeners are people who pay attention, have patience, and are persistent. Our scattered thoughts and our uncontrolled mental pictures become like white noise to our horses if we don't manage them. This has to happen. Horses who live near shooting ranges, highways, airports, or railroads don't even notice the noise after a while. It just fades into the background. They have to be able to make distinctions about what's important and what's not. Taking the time to observe and wait with an attitude of patience to allow the horses to show us what they need is how to become someone who listens to horses. Horses are magnetized to people who will hear and clearly act on the horse's communicated wants and needs. True communication is a two-way street of sharing and understanding. You see the look on her face? Do you see her looking right at me in that camera there, in that picture? That's a horse that's in communication. Okay, so we're gonna have a little video teaching. Are you raring to go? This is my little colt when he was just a couple of days old. Um, I want you to watch for, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a 48 second video. This is a little bit of eye training for you. I'm gonna watch this 48 second video and I want you to watch the persistence of the human, it's me with Sterling. And um, it's very short. I just want you to watch the human. You can watch the horse too, but I want you to watch how I'm teaching him and how I'm willing to um, address everything that happens in the moment when it happens, okay? All right, here we go.
sorry. <laughs> oh, that was terrible. <laughs> sorry, you have to watch it again. <laughs> We're going to start from the beginning. But I'll help you with this one, right? I'll talk you through this. So that's his food, and I just put it in his bowl. And see, he's being a little pushy, and I picked up a little tree branch. Now watch this big weight. See that big weight right there? Now wait. Ah, oh, you wait and go back. There you go. No, go back. Look, he turns his head. Like, yeah, I can't go. <laughs> Good boy. Okay, so, um, and then from there, we just, I just release him and he goes back and he eats his food, right? So I'm going to play it again. Okay. And so now I would just want to talk you through it, right? So that's his food. And that's just a little tree branch right there that I have out. And it's, see, I just wave it across his food bowl because he's being a little bit uh, pushy about it. And then I just ask him to go back and he happily does, right? And there's that big weight in my hand signal that says, you wait. Now you saw what I was going to do, right? So there I have to say, hey, go back and wait. Good. Now wait. It's like, oh, I'm coming over. No, no. Go back. And not just turn your head and don't just rock your weight. Really, like go back and wait. Thank you. Good. And now you see the weight in my hand? See my right hand there has a little bit of weight in it? It's saying, yeah, you wait right there. And now just, I trust him, right? I'm not looking back. I'm not worried. I in complete confidence. I'm like, he's going to be there when I turn around. Now I say, come, and he leaps into action, right? And he comes to me, but then he comes like right through me. And I'm like, no, you go back. You be soft, soft and gentle. Oh my goodness. Soft. So we can have some soft kisses there. So that, that can be taught in, well, depending on your horse, doesn't have to take long. It doesn't have to take long. I mean, it can take a month, you know, and have him not be worrying about the food and have him be responsive. You know, he'll, inside of this little feeding ritual, he'll do a, pretty much anything I ask, figure eight around the bar barrels, canter around me in circles, back through that car wash, um, lay down, roll over, sit, <laughs> whatever I can think of. Um, stand on the tires, stand on the balance beam. I, anything I can think of. Uh, imagination is only the limit. All right, so remember those three promises right in the beginning. The number, the, the, the three things that are the biggest issues that people have today with their horses are fear, right? Fear of, um, you know, being hurt and fear of messing up your horse. Um, you know, a, an issue with fitness. I'm not fit enough to do all the things that I really want to do with my horse. And then all that conflicting information, right? So my goal was to cover all that stuff today. And hopefully you have some facility and you feel like a little bit empowered around all of those things that you can know that there is a way through all of those things. And so here I'm going to start talking with you now about the offer that I have for you today. And this is my online one-on-one -on -one personal coaching program that happens anywhere in the world. So this is an online one-on-one -on -one personal coaching program. This is not a great big group program that you'll be in with a whole bunch of other people. This is me and you talking about exactly what you want and creating a program so you can actually live the dream that you got a horse for before we, there's no more time to do that. I will hold your hand the whole time. So this program is for you. If you don't want to waste another day missing out on a truly magnetized relationship with your horse, if in six months you actually want something to be different and you don't want to be coming out of winter 10 pounds heavier with the same problems you have now, 
now's a good opportunity to take me up on my offer. If you know that what you're doing right now is not working or it's not working as well as you'd like it to be working. If you're done buying gadgets and paying monthly fees and the piecemeal approach to horse training, it only makes the slightest bit of difference in lieu of actually knowing how to train your horse. If you're tired of the round pen or you're tired of the lunge line that only exercises your horse's body and barely your horse's mind, it just becomes, you have an obedient horse instead of a connected horse. Here's how the program works. Each week, we'll talk on the phone or we'll talk on Zoom. This is a Zoom program, face-to-face, -face, just like this. Only you'll see my little picture in the corner. Your little face will be there right next to mine. And we can do just what we did with the Sterling video. Like we can watch it and we can zoom back and forth on it and we can dissect it. This is like if you're in Australia or in Hawaii. Um, if you're local, I'll come and see you or you can bring your horse to me and you can come and see me. So we can actually meet in person. Every week, I will custom make uh, email lessons and videos for you. I won't always make a video because some things don't need them, but when there's video that's needed, I make a custom video for you. But you'll have email lessons with homework and actionable items every single week. And these come dripped with you in 24 lessons. And these are not just stock emails. I mean, there's some information that everybody needs, but these emails are gonna be custom designed to what you want, what you need, for you and your horse so you can actually reach your dreams. You're in the right place if you have a desire to be the change that you'd like to see in your horse-human relationship where communication is a two-way street and relationship is what keeps everyone safe. If you're in it for the peace and joy that you'll experience as you see yourself and your horse make changes together that actually shape your dream relationship, you're in the right place. Here's a testimonial from one of my students who had just completed a series of lessons with me and she said that she, she learned having, uh, she actually had a great time learning about not only her horsemanship but her humanship. And she knows that, I, she said, I know my horse has got a lot out of seeing me become a better leader and partner by my becoming clearer in my requests of what I ask for them. I still have a lot more lear to learn, and I'm grateful to my friend and teacher for working with us in honesty. I want you to be the peacock. I want you to be loud and proud about your horsemanship, about your relationship with your horse. I want you to be confident in knowing that what you're doing is the right thing, and you don't question yourself. At the end of six months, you will be your own problem solver. You will have the skills to think your way through using principles instead of the rules. You won't always wonder if you're doing the right thing. This program is right for you if you're unwilling to set limits on having your dream relationship with your horse every single day, not just on a good day. This program is for you if you're excited to explore what's possible in a relationship with your horse. Even if you've never worked one-on-one -on -one with a coach, even if you're brand new to horses, even if you've had horses all of your life, this six-month program is custom designed to meet your goals. These are some of the possible goals that you might have and definitely some of the lessons that we'll cover, like true communication with your horse, that two-way street I keep talking about, where your horse is listening to you and talking to you and asking you questions, and you're listening to your horse and talking to your horse and asking your horse questions, and you guys are actually sharing the answers. That's called the conversation. You'll have such an ability to cleanly observe what's happening to you and your horse that you're gonna be your own problem solver. You're gonna really understand shaping and sharing space close or far away. You're gonna understand what is consensual leadership, what is shared leadership, not a dominant hierarchy relationship, but what is shared leadership? You're gonna know how to have your horse say yes and be as light as a want to. 
in that yes, not only in mind, but in body. You're gonna learn the principles of improvisation, and this is so much fun, because this is where grace and harmony and the dance of horsemanship actually come from. When you're improvising with your horse and you're saying yes, and your horse is saying, what do you think about this? And you're like, that's so cool. And you're saying, man, you wanna come on over here and do this? And your horse is saying, yes, I would love to do that. That's, that's, a, that's an improvised relationship that's fun. That creates lightness and harmony and communication and a desire to be together. Faith and encouraging goodwill, actually productive emotion use is what we're talking about there. Liberty, so no strings at all attached in close proximity or in large spaces. And we take all of this information to riding if that's what you wanna do. You'll have results with grace. And you'll be in good company. Um, you'll get to join our small and private Facebook group that's only full of my committed coaching clients and my long-term committed students. So sometimes the conversations we have in there are really, really interesting. And sometimes people, lots of people can answer your questions in there. And if you have any, that's a good place to put them. Speaking of questions, if you have any questions, feel free to be typing them in the chat. When we're done here, I'll just jump out of the sharing my screen and I'll look in the chat. And if for some reason I don't get to answering those questions tonight, I'll make sure that you have an email with those answers in it, or I will answer your questions. I love answering questions. And so what will you have in six months? You're gonna have a horse who asks you questions and you will fully recognize this and you'll have the answers. You'll have a magnetized horse-human relationship, safe, confident, and having fun. Choosing to work with me one-on-one -on -one to realize your dreams is a gift worth giving yourself today, right here on the very first day of autumn. For the Love of Horses is my trademarked program, and it's a one-of-a-kind coaching relationship. And I am only one person. Like I said, this is not a big, giant, great big coaching program. It's me and you. I believe in giving myself fully, and I will over-deliver. I will hold your hand the entire six months as we go through this one-on-one -on -one coaching relationship together. And there are very few spots in this program. I have one more spot open now, and then there'll be a, a wait list until uh, December. So what I want you to know is, you know, for 18 years while I was working my way through my horsemanship program and I was raising my children, I worked in construction. And it was really while I was in a personal development program that I chose to change my life and go away to horsemanship school. So I know what it means to take big risks and to follow your dreams. That was an unlikely thing to happen. It was not reasonable. It was when I came home from horsemanship school that I began a 12 year journey of observation and self-discovery in my arena with my loose horses and more than 15,000 people and counting while they learned about their own patterns of behavior through my equine assisted learning company. That's a lot of people. And I know what it means to learn through the horses because that's how I've been learning for all these years. That's how I've been learning about myself and my patterns of habits, patterns and habits. And now, truly, I get to live my dream life with my horses every single day, and you can do that too. And I really want to be the one who helps you. So this full six-month coaching program, there's going to be an investment for it. One-on-one -on -one coaching is personal and private. And because you're still here, there's going to be discounts because you're going to ask me for them. And there's more, but I want you to look and see in the, you see in the background of this picture, this is my living quarters horse trailer. This is a really fun thing I get to do. I get to travel all about with my horses. I just went away this past weekend. I went to a workshop where I took my horse in my trailer and I got to live in my living quarters trailer. It's a fun thing to do. If you want to go camping, if it's something you do, let me know because I'd love to go with you. I'd love to to do that, it'd be a really cool thing to do. But there are, there's still, a, a, there's still bonuses for another spot, and that's, um, we get that, and I jokingly say, right, no, it's, your bonus is not a pony, that's my pony, and you can't have her. Um, but you're, 
right now, the way the program is set up is we have um, one phone call each week. And then we have an opportunity each week. Uh, you'll get your lesson dripped to you in the email, and then we'll have a troubleshooting um, strategy. And we can do that in a phone call, or we can do that on Zoom like this, where we either meet face-to-face, -face, just because some people like to learn and look at people's face when we're talking, or we can um, just share a screen on a video like this, and we can troubleshoot and go back and forth and stop and pause and rewind and really look at all the little nuances away from your horse about how to fix that stuff. I have to tell you, learning away from your horse is really, really helpful. Um, so one of the bonuses that you get is um, you'll get a second phone call or a second opportunity to have this one-on-one -on -one time uh, with me each week of your 24-week program. So that's I mean, that's a $4,800 bonus that I just gave you, but I don't sell my program a la carte. It only has to be, uh, it only can be part of this program. And there's actually, um, there's an, a fast action bonus. So anybody who books um, a free discovery call, it's going to be right, oh, it's coming. Um, anybody who books a free discovery call right off of the webinar, so within the next 24 hours, there's a fast action bonus. So um, there's a couple of bonuses piling up here. Um, this is, isn't this a great photo? I took this photo when I was out watching Eagles one day. And um, what I know is that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And I'm going to just ask you, are you ready to live your dream with your horse? If you are, here's how you get a hold of me. Um, so this is a direct booking uh, telephone call service. So you go to this um, this uh, web page, marianbrewer.org acuityscheduling.com and there's a list of available times there and you can pick an available time and you book a call with me and I will um, then on the, at our prescribed time you'll call me and we'll spend an hour on the phone exploring what's possible for the love of horses you know what's possible for you and your horse and if it's a fit if it's a match if you know you decide well first of all I would think at this point, if you call me, you probably think you want to work with me. You might have questions about the program, obviously. But if it's a match, if I feel like I can help you achieve your dream, because that's I'm in the business of helping people live their dreams. Um, you know, if it's a match for us, then we'll we'll enter into a six month coaching agreement. And you know, in by let's just say we start now, we'll end in March. You know, your winter will be very different. When you're looking at a committed partner who's holding you to account and giving you lots and lots of great information and exercises to do all winter long with your horse, you won't have the winter blues. You'll be going through the winter with your horse, seeing your horse every day and taking ground on your dreams. Instead of coming out of winter in six months and saying, hmm, I wonder how I can get this horse going now after you've taken six months off. So I just want to encourage you to uh, head over to marianbrewer.acuityscheduling.com and let's just explore what's possible. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to jump in the chat and see if there's any questions. So if there's not any um, questions, oops, I wanted to, yeah, there we go. If there's not any questions, then I'll say goodnight. Um, but if there are any questions, I think there's a QA and a um, button here, and there's also the chat. So I'm going to head to the chat first. And um, nope, nobody's saying anything in the chat, so I'm guessing you don't have any questions. I'm going to check over the Q&A because sometimes people put questions in there. But if you have any, um, you can feel free to do that. Nope, no open questions in the Q&A. Good. Perfect. Well, then I'm just going to go ahead and say goodnight to you guys. It's just 8... Uh, 30 and so I'm going to say good night and thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks for being with me on the webinar. I trust you got value out of it and you're going to take some of this information back home with you. Um, I look forward to talking with you on the phone and um, happy autumn 2017 everyone. Today is the very first day. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.